Amen. That's a really good chapter <laughs> right there in the Bible. That's, a, that's just a great uh, conversation, especially um, with what we're going to talk about this evening. So this morning, we talked about um, Jesus and the importance. We, we talked about, you know, why, why did God send a baby? You know, why did God send Jesus as a baby? Why not just a grown man? Why not, um, you know, why did God have to be a man? And we looked at those um, items this morning. Tonight, we're going to look at the other side of that coin, which is, you know, why is, you know, is Jesus God? You know, did Jesus say that he was God? Obviously, you read that chapter, you know, Jesus is saying, I'm God, I'm God, I'm God. Uh, you know, God is my Father. My Father has sent me over and over again to the point where if you're saved and you're reading that, it's almost maddening to just like, see this conversation going back and forth um, between um, the Pharisees and Jesus. And finally, at the end, he's just like, I'm God. <laughs> you know, he's just like, come on. But anyway, um, Tonight I want to talk about why the importance or the importance of Jesus being God. You know, as I said this morning, there's two, um, there's a lot of heresies out there against um, the Bible, against biblical doctrine. Obviously, there's a lot of false doctrine, a lot of false gospels. Um, but, you know, two major heresies are denying the manhood of Jesus and also denying the deity of Jesus. You know, this is the, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses. They deny the deity of Christ, the Mormons to a degree deny the deity of Christ. They, they claim he's a God. He's, he's one of many gods that we can attain that same level if we live right and do all these things. Uh, but no, Jesus is the God. He is the almighty God. Look at John chapter 1. You actually keep your place in John chapter 8. Um, keep a bookmark there and go to John chapter 1. So John chapter 1 is a great chapter to take people to, um, to just explain very simply um, that Jesus is God, that, you know, Jesus being born on this earth was man and God at the same time. Look at John chapter 1 and verse number 1, where the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus is the Word, and the Word was God. Look at verse 14 of the same chapter. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So that is, you know, the Word becoming born as the baby Jesus and we beheld his glory, and the glory was as of the begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Of course, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, the Bible says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So right there, like his name Emmanuel means, I mean, the Bible literally defines it as, you know, Emmanuel, that's one of his names, God is with us now, which is the same thing John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 14 says. Isaiah 9, 6. Isaiah 9, 6, the front of your bulletin, the verse of the week, the Bible says, this is a prophecy of the coming of Christ. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. So he's got a lot of different names, right? Emmanuel, God with us, is one of his names. Wonderful is one of his names. Counselor is one of his names. Notice how those are two, you know, separate words. Wonderful is a name. Counselor is a name. Look at the next one. The mighty God is a name for Jesus, right? It doesn't say a God or mighty God. It just says the mighty God. I mean, what do the Jehovah's Witnesses do with that? I mean, what do they do with that verse? The everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He's not a God. He's not you know, God-like, he is the God. He is, you know, the, you know, the Trinity. This is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's the second person of the Trinity. Now, there's this, I don't know if you've ever heard this, or you'll, you'll probably hear this at some point. If you become, you know, if you go out and you go soul winning enough, you're going to hear this. This is something that you'll hear from secular people that know nothing about the Bible, is this idea that, uh, yeah, Jesus never even claimed to be God, which is why we read John chapter 8. Because John chapter 8, the entire chapter, Jesus is telling the Pharisees that he is God, that he is the Son of God, and they're just not getting it. They're not getting it. But you hear this? It's one of the dumbest secular comments that I really I've ever heard, is just this idea that, you know, Jesus never claimed to be God. You know, just because he didn't say it in some you know, dumbed down English sentence like, hey, dudes, I'm God. You know, I mean, just because he didn't say it that way, he literally said that he is God in John chapter 8. So 
Tonight, in the sermon this evening, I want to show you why it's important. I'm going to show you Jesus's, I'm going to show you some red words. If you ever read a letter Bible, I'm going to show you some red words that prove Jesus literally said he is God. And then I'm going to show you why he had to be God. Why none of this works if Jesus wasn't God. This morning we looked at how Jesus had to be a man or none of this works. But Jesus, this isn't a zero-sum game. He's 100% man and 100% God, and both had to be true or were not saved. Salvation, the plan that God laid forth, would not work. So that's what we're going to look at um, this evening. So go to John chapter 8 now. Let's look at my, some of my favorite red words in the Bible, especially when it comes to Jesus talking about that he is God. Now, of course, the whole... The whole debate between Jesus and, you know, the Pharisees is, you know, I am of my father, you are not of my father, you are of the devil, you know, you're not of Abraham, you know, and he's just saying, like, if you, if you believe the father, you'd believe me. He's just trying to get this idea across that he and the father are one, and if they really truly believed in God, if their heart was right towards their heavenly father, they would accept him, and he wouldn't be having this debate. And finally, at the end of the chapter, he finally just gets very, very blunt with them and just gets right to the point. Look at verse number 56. Look what Jesus says. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, because they're bringing up Abraham. Right? Isn't that what they're doing in John chapter 8? Like, oh, our father's Abraham, and Abraham this. What are they doing? They're bragging in their genealogy. They're bragging because, you know, they were descended from Abraham. That they're part of the nation of Israel. And like, like we've studied over and over and over in this church, none of that makes any difference. You know, Jesus says, I'm able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Look at verse 56. He says, your father. So now he starts just, he's going to address them on their terms. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. I'll get back to that verse in just a few minutes. But then he then said the Jews to him, thou art not yet 50 years old and thou hast seen Abraham? Ah, uh, Yes is the answer to that, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But look at verse 58. Jesus saith unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. So there's three things in these three verses that I need to point out to you about what Jesus is saying here. Turn to Exodus chapter 3. Before Abraham was, I am, Jesus says. You say, okay, that, that doesn't sound like um, proper English there. You know, is, is he kind of... Mixing up words here? No, I mean, look, look, there's nothing proper about the English that we hear today, okay? So, before Abraham was, I am, is what Jesus says. It makes perfect sense. And you know what? These Pharisees knew exactly what he was talking about because they knew what Exodus chapter 3 said. Look at verse 4, 13, 13 of Exodus chapter 3. Go ahead and go there because this is super important. And you know what? You should put a footnote in your Bible, if you don't mind writing in your Bible, in John chapter 8, in verse number 58, and just say Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 through 14. Because look at what the Bible says. Before Abraham was, I am, Jesus says. Look what he says in verse 13 of Exodus chapter 3. Look what the Bible says. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Moses is literally asking God, What's your name? The people are going to ask me what your name is. What should I tell them? And look what God says in verse 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shall thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Meaning, it's a re I am is a replacement or a synonym. It's one of God's literal names. I am. God is literally saying, I am is the name that I want you to give to the children of Israel when they ask you what my name is. This is what Jesus was referring to in John chapter 8 and verse number 58. He's saying, before Abraham was, I'm God. That's what Jesus says. Jesus never claimed he was God. Read, learn the Bible. Jesus literally said at the end... Jesus is so frustrated at the end of John chapter 8, after going back and forth and back and forth about who he is, and they are not getting it, he basically finally says to them, I am God. 
God is my name. I am is the name of God. And they knew exactly what he said because the very next verse, they took up stones to try to kill him. Because they knew he just said, I'm God. Look, the Pharisees weren't clueless about who Jesus was saying that he was. At the end of the Gospels, right before they crucify him, is like, they said, hey, why do we even need? They got all these false witnesses to try to have this mock trial. And finally, like he's like, they knew exactly what he was saying. They, finally, they said in Luke 22, I believe it is, they said, finally, they said, why do we need witnesses? He just said that he's God out of his own mouth, and we all heard it. He just blasphemed. The Pharisees knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. They just didn't believe him. They didn't believe him. So Jesus literally says in verse 58, I am God. This is my name, just like God. So that's the first thing. I am is one of God's name. That's the first thing that we need to learn from these three verses. And the next one, he says, before Abraham, he's literally using it, that name as a replacement for the Lord or for God. And the next, one, next thing you need to understand is that before Abraham, I am. So he's saying that they're saying, you knew Abraham? He's like, I was before Abraham. So let me ask you this. If Jesus didn't say he's God, how could he be before Abraham? He literally said that he existed before Abraham. Is that possible for a man? So he says he's God twice here. He says he's God by, by having existed throughout eternity, and also his name is the same as God's name. So we see two proofs here. So I mean, just because people know nothing about God or the Bible or the Word of God, I mean... Jesus clearly is, is saying that he is God right here. Now, look at verse, here's the third thing. So he says that he is, he literally says, my name is the same as God. <laughs> he says, I existed before Abraham. And then on the third thing is this, he says in verse 56, he says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. He's saying, you know what he's saying? He's saying Abraham saw Jesus. That's what he is saying. And that's why, that's why and again, they knew exactly what he was talking about because they said, you're not even 50, and you saw Abraham? And then he's like, I not only saw Abraham, I existed before Abraham. I mean, let me translate this into modern English for people because he's basically saying, Abraham saw me. You, you knew Abraham? I, I was before Abraham, and by the way, I am God. That, that's basically this, this thing broken down into modern, you know, simple English for people. Go to Genesis chapter 18. You say, Abraham saw Jesus? Yeah, it's right there in the Bible. Abraham saw Jesus twice, actually. Go to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18, in verse number 1, look what the Bible says here. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 18, and this is the second time, but we'll start with the second time and we'll work it backwards. Genesis chapter 18, right before Genesis chapter 19 is when God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, in Genesis chapter 18, look at verse number 1, the Bible says, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door at the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. And said, now first of all, I, I want to point something out here that will be important you know, in just a few minutes. But notice how the Lord didn't say, I am the Lord. Abraham just knew that this was the Lord. It says the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre. And then look at verse 13 or verse 3. And Abraham says this, and said, My Lord, if I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. So Abraham and, and God have this, this back and forth here. And they have this back and forth on, on God's telling him, you know, basically he's like, should I hide from Abraham what I'm going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah? And then finally he tells him he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of the cries of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then it goes into this famous, uh, you know, uh, back and forth between the Lord and Abraham about, well, are you going to, Abraham basically says, are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? And then God says, well, what do you mean? And he's like, if there's 50 righteous men, are you going to destroy him? And God says, I won't destroy him if there's 50. And then he goes 40, or I think he goes 45, he goes 40, he goes 30. Just this big back and forth. God's like, no, I won't destroy it for 30. 
no, I won't destroy it for 20. Abraham's like, what about 10? And God's like, no, I won't even destroy it for 10. Meaning like everybody except Lot's family was wicked in this city. Okay? And then look at Genesis chapter 19 and verse number 1. So Genesis chapter 19 and verse number 1 is an important verse here. So we know that the Lord visited Abraham, but we know that there was three men there. All right, there was three men. The Lord visited Abraham. Look at verse uh, number one of Genesis chapter 19. And there came two angels to Sodom at even. So the Bible says that no man can see God and live. God the Father. Okay, so here we have the Son of God in an Old Testament appearance with two angels. So basically we have three men. One is Jesus and the other are two angels. Because look, angels would never allow themselves to be called the Lord. Angels would never allow themselves to be worshipped. They act just like a man if somebody tries to worship them. They're like, no, I'm not, I'm not God. So you have Jesus appearing in the Old Testament to Abraham along with two angels that continue to Sodom and Gomorrah and handle things there. Now here's what's interesting. Go to Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. There's another Old Testament appearance of Jesus here in Genesis chapter 14. So we see that, that Abraham knew, or Abraham met um, the Lord Jesus Christ in Genesis chapter 18. But look at Genesis chapter 14 and verse number 18. The Bible says, And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God, and blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram, is Abram yet, of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. This is where Abram went and rescued um, Lot, and he just rescued um, all these people, and he took all the spoil um, from this battle. and said he blessed him and blessed Abram, the Most High God. So he meets this, this priest, this king of Salem. And blessed be the Most High God, which had delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. So here is kind of this, if you would just read the Old Testament, it seems like throughout the story of what actually happens, when Abram goes to battle here and takes all this spoil and, and you know, defeats these wicked people, this seems like kind of a side note. You're just like, okay, this is kind of strange. Why was that put in there? But then we get some more information about this meeting of Melchizedek in Hebrews chapter 7. So Hebrews chapter 7, of course, proving once again to me that Jesus gave revelation to Paul. I mean, Jesus taught Paul. I mean, Jesus himself took Paul off for three years and just gave him all kinds of information and all kinds of revelation that Paul then wrote down for us in the Bible. Look at Hebrews chapter 7. So we see that Abram meets this, this king of Salem, this high priest, this, this priest of the Most High God, and he, and he tithes to this priest. He gives 10% of all these, this spoil to this priest. Look at verse number 1 of Hebrews chapter 7. Look what the Bible says. It says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem. This is referring to the man that Abraham, Abram, I'm sorry, met in Genesis chapter 14, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. That matches exactly what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 14. We definitely know that what Hebrews 7 is talking about is talking about this same Melchizedek that Abram met, you know, after this battle when he gave him this tithe of this spoil. And after that also, to all Asa, he gave a tenth part of all, verse number two, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Now we're, okay, what, what's, what's, who was this guy? Now look at verse number three. Now we see who he was. From Hebrews chapter seven, verse number three clears it up for us. It says, this, this Melchizedek was without father, without mother, without descent, having neither been of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. This was an Old Testament appearance again of Jesus Christ to Abraham or Abram at that time. Now here's something I just think about. Something I just think about, and this just, I, I don't know this, but... Is, did Abraham recognize him in Genesis chapter 18 when he was sitting at the door of his tent? And is that why he, you know, just, he's, I mean, he didn't, the guy didn't announce himself and say, I am the Lord, 
Abraham saw him and immediately knew that he was the Lord. And it's because, I believe, that it's because he met him already in Genesis chapter 14. So look, all that to say this. In John chapter 8, when Jesus is talking about Abraham, they met before. <laughs> that's, that's all I'm trying to say. All I'm trying to say is, yeah, Jesus did meet Abraham. And Jesus also was, he was not created, he always was. He was, you know, he, he never, he, he didn't have the beginning of days nor end of life. Yes, he was manifest in the flesh as the baby Jesus. But the word Jesus was always there. Like he literally created the universe. He literally created creation, Jesus. So Jesus is clearly God. I mean, the Bible clearly teaches that. To, to say that that's all, that's, that's what literally got Jesus killed is because he just wouldn't stop saying that he is God. So to say that, like, you know, Jesus never claimed that he was God, I, I don't know. I've heard that too many times in my life, I think. But why did God, why did Jesus have to be God? Now that you believe me that Jesus is God, why did he have to be God? Why did he have to be God to redeem man? There's three reasons. All right, all that for, you know, purpose of introduction, there's three reasons that not only did Jesus have to be fully man, but he also had to be fully God. We know that he had to be, you know, he had to be perfect from this morning. He had to live this perfect life. He had to be a lamb without spot. You know, he had to be that perfect sacrifice. The first reason that Jesus had to be God is because man can't be perfect. Because no man on the planet could be perfect. Because there's none righteous. No, not one. It couldn't be done. And look, here's the thing. You can't even, as a man, you can't even look at the example of Jesus who lived a perfect sinless life and say, well, that's not fair because I can't do that. You can't say that because guess what? God doesn't expect you to. If God expected you to live a perfect sinless life in order to be saved, that would have been part of salvation. But that's why works have literally nothing to do with salvation. So God, Jesus had to be God in order to accomplish that having that flesh while not sinning. So that's why, Jesus, that's one of the reasons that, and look, man couldn't do it. Man couldn't do it. But guess what? God doesn't expect you to. He did it. He did it. That's why works isn't even 0.5% of salvation. It's not any part of it. It's not any part of salvation. So we see that. Man can't do what Jesus did. Jesus had to be God in order to accomplish that perfect sinless life that was that perfect, innocent blood sacrifice that we talked about this morning. Now here's the other one. Here's the other one. Here's, the, here's, here's reason number two and reason number three. And they both fit into this main category of this. Man can't defeat death. Man can't defeat death. Only God can defeat death. That's why Jesus had to be fully God. And why is it two parts? Why is there, you know, reason number two and reason number three? Because there's two deaths. And Jesus defeated them both, proving that he was God. Proving that he was God and also showing that, like, that's why the Messiah had to be God. Turn to Luke chapter 16. Look, the Bible says, first of all, the first death, man can't defeat the first death. The Bible says it's appointed, uh, you know, it's appointed unto man to die once. You know, I mean, we are going to die. It's appointed for man to, once to die, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9. You're going to physically die. I don't care how old you are or how young you are, you are, you are appointed to physically die one day. You know, unless we're raptured tomorrow, you know, which is not going to happen, you know, we're all going to physically die one day. So look, he defeats the physical death, that first death, but the main one, look at Luke chapter 16. Man cannot do what Jesus did, proving again that he was God and the necessity for him to be God. Look at Luke chapter 16. Look at verse 19. I just got in a, a debate about this. Somebody didn't believe in hell, and I just got in a debate with this. But notice how in the Bible, in Luke chapter 16 and verse 19, 
Notice what the Bible says here at the first few words of this, this verse. The Bible says, there was a certain rich man. Now, this is not, there, this is like an unto a certain rich man, or this is like as, or this is not a metaphor, this is not a parable. It literally says, there was a man. It says, there was a guy like this, and there was another guy like this. In verse number 20, it says, there was a, it, there was a certain rich man, which was in, clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And again, verse 20, and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sorts. Look, this is a story of two people that actually happened, that Jesus is talking about here. And the, the beggar, it says, and he desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. So the beggar died and he, he went to heaven. Abraham's bosom is just heaven. Okay, that's what it is. All right? it's that, there's some weird doctrine that comes from this one time that this word is, you know, this, these two words are used. It's just talking about the beggar died and he went to heaven. And look, it really doesn't have anything to do with the fact that he was a beggar and the one guy was a rich man. Other than it's very hard for a rich person to get saved. You know, it's very, you know, it's very unlikely Jesus says that a rich person will be saved. Why? Because they're proud and they're prideful and they don't believe that, you know, they need to be saved. But it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. So they both died. The beggar goes to heaven. And look at verse 23. It says, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. So the rich man dies and immediately, first of all, you know, you don't, there's no soul sleep. You don't, you know, go to sleep and for whatever until the millennial reign or after or anything like that. It's just you die and you woke up and he was in hell. I mean, hell is like as soon as you, your physical life stops and you are unsaved, you are, your soul is immediately in hell. And, you know, I have been told that people, people are very fearful that are unsaved when they go into that moment, look, it's something in their conscience makes them very fearful of dying. And they get to that moment and because hell is right at the door. It is right there. It's not 20 years off. It's not 50 years off. As you come to the end of your life and you are not saved, hell is right there. This man opened his eyes right after he died and he was, and look, he was in torments. And he could see he could see Lazarus in heaven. And he cried. Look what he said. and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Look, I mean, Abraham's bosom, all it means is, all it was talking about is just referring to the place that Abraham was. <laughs> it's all it was. He's saying he's with Abraham. He's in the arms of Abraham. That's all that this is talking about. And he cried, and he said, Father Abraham, he's literally talking to literal Abraham here, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Look, he's tormented in, in a very specific way here. He's, he's burning. He's burning. It's a terrible thing to even think about. All right? But Abraham said, Son, remember that, in that well, thou in thy lifetime receivest thou good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. But here is the real key, right here in verse number 26. All that to say this. Abraham ultimately tells him, look, here's the rules, Abraham says. He says, besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. It's like nobody can come from heaven and go to hell, is what Abraham is saying. I mean, he's, he's saying, we can't come and get you. Abraham is telling this man. He's like, Abraham's kind of being a little bit compassionate here. He's just saying, look, I, he's like, even if I could, he's like, there's nothing we can do. He's like, there's this gulf fixed. We can't come to you. We can't come. Because what did he want? What did he want? He wanted Lazarus to give him some water. He wanted somebody to, to, to give him a little bit of comfort. He's like, we can't come there. We can't come there. But here's the biggest one. It says, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. 
he, what he just told this man that is in hell, he says, you can't get out. There is no getting out. This is the problem. Now turn to Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 18. Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 18. Why did Jesus have to be God? Why did he have to be the mighty God? Why did he have to be the only God, period? Here is why. Because, first of all, man cannot defeat physical death. We're all appointed to die. We know that's going to happen. But there's more than a physical death. There's a second death. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. When you die in your soul, as an unsaved person, your soul goes to hell. That is what the Bible calls the second death. Yeah, and I get it. Hell is going to be cast into the lake of fire. But the point is, the death of your soul in hell is, what, that, is that spiritual death, that second death. But look, you say, why did Jesus go to hell in Acts chapter 2? You say, why did Jesus' soul have to go to hell where the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 in verse number 27? It's a little bit of an obscure thing. It's a little bit of just, it's kind of just mentioned a couple times in the Bible. It says, because thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption in verse 27 of Acts chapter 2. Why did Jesus' soul, when he died on the cross, go to hell? Why did he have to? Why was it necessary? And look, I get it. God would never, you know, put us in, in danger of something that he wasn't willing to go through himself. We see that in his character from, from this morning's sermon. But here's the main reason. Look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 18. This is the main reason that Jesus' soul went to hell. Look at verse number 18. It says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And guess what? And have the keys of hell and death. Je the main reason that Jesus went to hell, his soul went to hell, is to prove that he could come out. Is to prove that he could defeat not only that physical death and physically resurrect, but prove that he could defeat the second death. He could, look, in order to completely defeat death for us, both deaths have to be defeated. Both of them, the physical death and the spiritual death, and he did both, and he proved it. And only God could do that. Man cannot do that. We can't defeat the first death or the second death. We can defeat nothing. Look, it's ultimately, you say, you say, why is this important? Look, this is super important when it comes to salvation. You say, why? Because in John 10, 28, where he says, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, Look, you know what Jesus is saying in John 10, 28? He's like, when I give you eternal life, then he says the other side of it. He, does he really have to say anything else after that? I give to them eternal life. We got it. But then he says, he says the opposite from the death perspective. He says, they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my head. But look, in order for God to give eternal salvation, he must have completely conquered death. Completely. The first one, and especially, especially the second one. Because he had, he had the keys. He could go in, and he could come out. Meaning, that life that God gives you, that eternal life that God gives you, will never experience that second death. Could God say that if he didn't have power over it? Could God say that he could grant you eternal salvation if he didn't have complete power over death? He couldn't, but he proved to us in God, in, in, the, in the God part of Jesus, that he could completely conquer death. So Jesus rising from the dead, the first, you know, that was conquering the first death, but him coming out of hell was conquering the second death. It was completely, you know, it was total power. That's why you have eternal salvation, because God has total power over death. The first one and the second one, not temporary power, not partial power, complete power. That's it. I mean, that wouldn't be true if you could lose your salvation. I mean, that wouldn't be true if you could lose your salvation. I mean, because it's not of works, and God, I mean, it's not of works, and God has complete power over death. That's why you have eternal salvation. I hope that makes sense, but that's exactly why Jesus had to be God.
right there. And if he wasn't, eternal salvation would not be something that would be achievable for us. So look, God took complete ownership of us, as we talked about this morning. Even after our rebellion, he used the same tool that he used to create us to save us as we rebelled in between. And he had to be fully man, and he had to be fully God. And look, here's another thing. Only God could execute. I mean, the more you dig into this plan, and the more you see how he did this, the more perfect it just gets revealed to us. And look, it, only God could do such a perfect thing successfully. Perfectly executed for our imperfection, if you want to think about it that way. Back in Isaiah 9, 6. Look, this is the whole package. This is the whole package this Christmas. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This is the gift. I mean, think about this for a second. Think about this for a second. I kind of talked about it. I want to talk about it in a different perspective than I talked about it this afternoon because I'm talking to a church full of saved people. I'm talking to a church full of people that have this gift. But that puts a little bit different perspective on all the stuff that we get for Christmas, isn't it? I mean, this is the gift. We, we give each other all this stuff, you know, and thank you for the stuff, and here's some stuff for you, and here's some stuff for me, and then we send stuff all over the country, and, and we buy stuff, and we, we put it in a box, and we spend as much on the box to ship the box across the country as we spent on the stuff in the first place, and nobody needs this stuff. Like I said, you know, I got a really nice tie here, and, and, I mean, I found myself this tie and this shirt. I found myself, like, staring at this tie and this shirt. I was like, could it match any better? They, I mean, how did they find this shirt, this shirt and this tie? I mean, I found myself just, I was trying to go over a sermon this afternoon, and I was just staring at my shirt and my tie. I'm like, this is amazing. But guess what? I've got 37 ties. You know, I mean, I really appreciate the gift, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate the time somebody spent on me, but I think we lose a little bit of perspective sometimes, even as Christians. Even as Christians, I've never understood all the stuff, to be honest, ever since I became, you know, not a child anymore. The true thing is this perfect package of Jesus. I mean, how could you ever be in a bad mood? <laughs> Look, I'm in a bad mood sometimes. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. But the point is, here we are. We, I'm not preaching to a group of people like, hey, you know, I was preaching. If I was preaching this to a bunch of people that weren't saved, I'd sit here and I'd try to convince them like, Look, you don't need a tie. You don't need stuff. But you need this gift. You need the Messiah. Here I'm talking to a bunch of people that have this gift. I mean, what a beautiful Christmas every single year. And then look, Jacob asked me today, it was Jesus born on the 25th and all or the 25th. It doesn't even matter. None of that even matters. Probably not. But here's what matters. You know what Jesus really likes for us to do? He likes for us to remember. He likes for us to remember him. You know, that this is a great time of year to remember the, the perfect sacrifice that this man who was also God at the same time did for us. And guess what? We all have it. Unto us. Unto us a son is given. Yes, unto us the whole world, but we took the gift. We took it. We have it. Our children are going to have it. So look, I, I get it. You know, I appreciate this stuff. I don't like losing the message. You know, Christmas should be a reminder for all of us for our blessings. I get it. You know, the, the more blessed is to give than to receive. I get that. But really, the gifts is about the gift. It's about the gift of a son. And look, it's really a reminder also for us to have some character that we have that gift and, and be those shepherds that make that gift known to the world. Yeah, Jesus had to be God and he had to be man. You say, which one? Both at the same time. 100%. It's not a zero-sum game. Merry Christmas, and, you know, we're all so very blessed to have this gift, you know, and we just need to make sure that we can just always remember that, always have the proper perspective on that, and, you know, just get this gift out to as many people as we possibly can.
I mean, that's, that's the goal. That's the goal of our lives, all right? Merry Christmas. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.